The black boxes, that is both the CVR, the cockpit voice recorder, and what is called the uh, TFR, both have been recovered. Walking round the clock to analyze critical data retrieved from the black boxes of Air India flight AI-171. Began extracting data from the plane's black boxes on 24th June. Now this black box does hold a significant keys. In fact, a lot many answers as to what led to the crash of flight AI-171. Why is it taking so long to get the information from the black boxes on Air India 171? Well, we're gonna explore that question in this video and we're gonna come up with an answer. It's more nuanced than you think. Now, Air India 171 was the aircraft that crashed the 787 in uh, Ahmedabad about two weeks ago and they have retrieved the black boxes and there's a misnomer there because they're not actually black they're actually bright orange to make them easy to retrieve. But they've retrieved the black boxes, and there are three things that we think of as the black boxes. There are two flight data recorders, one in the nose of the airplane, one in the tail of the airplane, and then the cockpit voice recorder, which is a third device. The cockpit voice recorder records the last two hours of sound from the cockpit. It's not just the voices of the pilots, it's any sound, so you can retrieve things clicking and moving also, and it retrieves just two hours. Last year, the FAA uh, in the United States uh, passed a bill uh, authorizing a 24-hour cockpit voice recorder. So all going forward, all US-built aircraft are gonna have to record for 24 hours, but right now, Two hours is the standard. The other two black boxes record between 17 and 24 hours of data, and it's all sorts of data from the airplane. It's anything you can imagine. It's the engine parameters, it's the altitude, it's the airspeed, it's where what position switches are in, whether the flaps are up or down. Virtually anything you can think of is contained in those 88 different data points that the flight data recorder records. Now, many airlines and uh, manufacturers are requiring more than 88 points. Those 88 points are mandated by uh, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, as a minimum. So so what, what's the difference between 17 hours and 24 hours of recording? Well, it's just how much, how many data points you record. If you record more than the 88, you're going to get a little bit less time before it records over itself again. Generally speaking, if you get 150 data points, it might take the 17 hours rather than the 24 hours. So both of the black boxes, the flight data recorders, and the cockpit voice recorder have been retrieved from Air India 171. The forward one was retrieved uh, the day after the crash, and the rear one was retrieved, I think, three or four days afterwards. Where are those black boxes today? They've been moved from Ahmedabad to Delhi, India. That's where they are today. Now, um, why is it taking so long? Well, let me explain a little bit about what the flight data recorder does and doesn't do, a little bit of the history behind it. It's actually fascinating. And then we'll delve into the interpretation process and how difficult it is actually to get the information out in a timely manner. And I think once we get done with this, you'll completely understand why it's taking so long and why it might take even longer. So the black box has an interesting history. It goes back all the way to World War II. Uh, British aircraft, uh, war aircraft in World War II, uh, were collecting secret information and the British just dubbed it the black box. And it probably back then was a black box, but it was black because it was secret. And so that expression became known for virtually every black box that an airplane carries. The very first airliner to carry a black box, a flight data recorder, was in 1941. And it it only recorded two bits of information. It recorded the altitude of the airplane and whether the radio was on or off. So we've come a long way uh, since those days and that 88 bits of data that it records is very comprehensive. And again, there's flight data recorders that record much more than that, but it goes all the way back to um, pre actually the beginning of, of World War II with flight data recorders. Now, these flight data recorders have been moved to Delhi. That Does it complicate things? Not really, but in a sense, uh, the flight data recorders are uh, interesting devices because they're designed to withstand 30 
400 G's of impact. That's a lot of G's. And so they're designed to withstand any impact, any crash that any airplane can experience. And of course, they've got one in the front and one in the back. They record the exact same data in case the one is destroyed. Perhaps the other one will be good. They've retrieved both and both of them are good but they are damaged. Now, if you've got a flight data recorder that's not damaged at all, you can simply plug a cord into it, hook it up to a laptop, and retrieve the data. It gets much more complicated when they're damaged. And so clearly with these, they couldn't just plug into them and retrieve the data. So now you've got to get the box physically out of the airplane, and it might mean welding it out or cutting it out. And then you got to take that thing and you've got to get it someplace where somebody can interpret it. It's been moved to Delhi. And there are basically three agencies involved here, actually four. There's Boeing Corporation, there's the US NTSB, and there's the AAIB, which is the Aviation Authority over in India. AAIB is in charge of this. They're the ones that have possession of the boxes, and so they're leading the investigation with the assistance of Boeing, NTSB, and the manufacturer of the, that's the fourth entity, of the black boxes. All of them are getting together. So now it gets complicated because all of those people have to come over to Delhi, they have to reposition, and when you go to get into a black box to retrieve the data on a damaged black box, you can't just open the lid to it or unscrew the end of it. It doesn't work like that. It's a completely sealed um, device. And so you've got to now cut into it, right? So now cutting into it is a delicate process because you don't want to further damage anything that's on the inside. So you have to have the right precision equipment to do that. That's got to get sent over there. Now you got to assess the uh, the the uh, equipment on the inside of the flight data recorder. Uh, there's a motherboard in there, and if that motherboard is intact, it might need some cleaning up. You're gonna remove that uh, motherboard, and then you've got to take the data off that motherboard, and you've got to, to um, basically put it into a good flight data recorder. That process takes time because you don't want to lose any of the data. You don't want to erase it or compromise it, and you want to make sure you've got a clean transfer of data into that good flight data recorder. So once the motherboard is retrieved from the damaged flight data recorder and the information off of that motherboard is transferred to the good flight data recorder, you can begin the interpretation process and that takes some time. So we'll put a pin in that for a minute because it's complicated in how it gets interpreted. Now let's take a look at um, some of the things that the, the flight data recorder does or doesn't do based on the various theories that we have so far in what brought Air India 171 down. The basic theories are this, a total electric failure, total hydraulic failure, or a dual engine failure, or a combination of all three at this point. We know that because we got confirmation. We've got that from major media sources now that the RAT was deployed. And one of those three things, or all three of those things, will deploy the RAT. Now, the question is, what if it was a total electrical failure? Would the flight data recorders just stop recording? And maybe we don't have any information from that point forward. Well, uh, they've thought of everything. And in the flight data recorder is something called RIPS, R-I-P-S. And it's a recorder internal power source. It's a, its own internal battery, and it runs for 10 minutes. And it's just in case there is a total electrical failure, the flight data recorders continue to get information. Now, this flight was a very short flight. It only lasted about 60 seconds. So I'm sure that the data they got was for the entire duration of the flight, basically because of those internal uh, batteries inside those flight data recorders. Now, if it wasn't a total electrical failure, it was a dual engine failure. All of that information happened rather quickly. And many of you are saying, well, it was such a short flight. Why is it taking so long to get the information? Well, it's precisely because it was such a short flight that it's going to take a longer time to get the information. Let me explain. I was once in, in an incident in a, a 767. We were going into Milan and we started our initial descent. We were at about 35,000 feet and a bus on the aircraft and the electrical system has things called buses. And they're just basically metal bars that have all the electronics attached to them. It's, it's very difficult to lose a bus, but we fried a bus. And I'm not sure exactly why the bus fried. All I know was that the cockpit lit up like a Christmas tree. Every single light you could imagine came up on my screens. They were red, they were green, they were yellow, and there was page after page. There was no way of telling what the initial problem was or what the secondary problems were because of all of the pages of lights. All I knew was the aircraft was very difficult to control because one of the lights was a yaw damper. 
You can feel that. An airliner needs the yaw dampers to work, and it was a real bear to fly, but it was still flyable. We got it down on the ground safely. That's exactly what happened in this black box, except probably on steroids. So in a short less than 60 second flight, something catastrophic happened, maybe several catastrophic things happened almost simultaneously so that this airplane began to lose lift. In the cockpit, you would have seen every light come up on the screen probably instantaneously. That same dynamic is taking place in the flight data recorders. All of this information almost simultaneously happens and it's all recorded in the flight data recorder. Now the flight data recorder is gonna capture all of it Right, so all that data is there, <clears throat> but since it happens so close to one another, it's almost like a tangled uh, ball of yarn. It can be straightened out, it can be undone, but it's much more complicated than a long string of yarn that has a couple of knots in it. And most incidents take place over time, eight, 10, 15 minutes, where you've got a, an initial incident, it leads to a secondary one, maybe a third one, and you can unknot all those little things along this timeline. This one happened all at once. So now that makes the interpretation process that much more complicated. They'll have all the data they need, but it's all happening instantaneously. And it may be difficult for them to look at it and say, well, this happened first, this happened second, this is what caused this. Again, it was such a short flight that the interpretation process is probably going to get bogged down. That's why it's taken so long up to this point. And it may take much longer for them to do it and to do it properly. If I'm leading that investigation, I wanna make sure that we get the proper answers, the correct answers before we go to the public with it. I don't wanna come out with a quick answer and then a few days or a few weeks later have to come back and retract all of that and say, well, it actually wasn't that. It was this. So it could be any number of things. The door is wide open still. The, the popular leading theories are total electrical failure, total hydraulic failure, some sort of engine, dual engine failure. Um, there is the fuel contamination theory. There is the vapor lock theory. There's the FADEC theory. All of those are wide open. Uh, I saw a video uh, and the uh, engineer had done a formula on what the odds were. Two and a half billion to one is a dual engine failure on a 787 right after takeoff. That's what we know happened or something similar to that happened where they lost lift. That's high odds, my friends. You have a higher probability of getting struck by lightning or winning the Powerball lottery than you do this ever happening again. So is it safe to fly? Absolutely. I think whatever happened on this airplane was a one-off. I don't think it'll ever uh, happen again. So uh, it's over in Delhi, the black box. Um, they're, they've got the teams in place. Uh, I have read reports that said that they do have the motherboard retrieved. They've retrieved the data. It was in good shape. They've transferred the data. I'm saying right now, I believe they're in the interp interpretation process. And that interpretation process is very much like that knotted ball of yarn. The interpreters have probably never seen anything quite like like this before because we haven't seen anything quite like this before and it's going to take them some time to unknot that knotted ball of yarn. Once they get it unknotted, I'm sure we're going to have a public pronouncement of what they think was the cause behind this crash. And that's the update on Air Neo 171. Now you know. I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe.